All right, if you were here for the last video, we talked about the second wave of European imperialism. Now in part two, we need to talk about the effects that wave of imperialism had on Europe itself and the African and Asian peoples they went out to conquer. So I hope you can already taste the sauce, and if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. So once industrialized European states set their sights on Africa as the object of their imperialistic impulses, they got to carving up the continent quick, fast, and in a hurry. And they did this, as I mentioned in the last video, so that they could gain access to more raw materials to feed their factories and to find new markets for their manufactured goods. But the greatness of these imperial nations was on the line too. The slogan of the era might as well have been, he who dies with the biggest empire wins. And so the race to colonize Africa, known as the scramble for Africa, ended up creating significant tension between European states who all wanted the biggest piece of the African pie for themselves. And this tension seemed as if it would lead to war at any moment. Therefore, starting in 1884, Otto von Bismarck called the Berlin Conference, which was a series of meetings in which the imperial powers of Europe could carve Africa up peacefully through discussion and negotiation. And you know, it, it actually worked. Like after the Berlin Conference, almost the entire continent of Africa was claimed by one of the European imperial powers, and they did it peacefully. Well done, Otto. You made everybody happy. Except the entire continent of Africans whom you did not invite to the conference who might have, you know, objected. But you didn't think everybody lived happily ever after, did you? <laughs> Don't be crazy. Like, even though the boundaries of African colonies were agreed upon at the Berlin Conference, it didn't take long before those tensions between European states flared up again like it did, for example, in the Fashoda Crisis. Both Britain and France wanted to connect their African empires via railroad, but there was a big fat problem for both of them, namely modest Sudan, which was owned by neither of them. Like, if either of them were gonna connect their railways, this was a key location. And both nations ended up sending military forces into Sudan and were on the brink of war. However, the French knew that they were very much outnumbered and outgunned by the British, and so they withdrew, ceding the territory to Britain. Now the French did this not only because they were outnumbered, but also they could see the growing influence of Germany in Africa and in Europe. And in that way, France very much needed a friend in Britain to fend off potential future conflicts with Germany. So France and Britain signed the Entente Cordiale in 1904, which established friendly relations between those two nations. And there were also the Moroccan crises. Like if France thought that they needed to buddy up with Britain to fend off German aggression, turns out, they were right. At the Berlin Conference, it was decided that France would control most of North Africa, including Morocco. But the Germans weren't too keen on this, and so in 1905 and 1911, the Germans backed native Moroccan rebellions against the French. And as a result, it smelled like war was in the air. But remember, France and Britain hugged it out in the Entente Cordiale, and so Germany, without the support of their allies, decided it was a bad move to test the strength of that alliance. And ultimately, the conflict was solved through diplomacy in which France retained control of Morocco. But what this crisis demonstrated was the increasing bond between France and Britain and the increasing antagonism between them and Germany, which is gonna come back around in World War One. Now, while all of this is going on in Africa between the heads of European states, there was a growing objection among some Europeans about whether imperialism was a good thing at all. Now, to be clear, this was not a majority voice. Most Europeans saw precisely nothing wrong with imperialism. But there were some who objected, and that objection gave rise to an increasingly tense debate over imperial ventures. The first objectors you should know were artists. British writer Joseph Conrad traveled to the Belgian Congo, which was arguably the most brutal of all the European colonial ventures, and he witnessed firsthand the degree and violent policies put in place there by King Leopold II of Belgium. And the Congo was a different kind of colony because Leopold kept it for himself, not for Belgium. And thus he enacted exceedingly savage and cruel policies against the Congolese in order to enrich himself. And so deeply disturbed by what he saw, Joseph Conrad returned and wrote his novel Heart of Darkness, which laid out in graphic detail the kinds of abuses the Congolese were experiencing under the imperial rule of Leopold. And though it was a work of fiction, Conrad's criticism of the system of coerced labor and brutality was apparent. And since we're talking about objections to brutality in the the Congo, you should know another British man, Edmund Morrill, formed the Congo Reform Association to address violence in the Congo. He gathered many notable writers of the age and outlined Leopold's violent policies in the Congo. And as a result, these writers flooded the European consciousness with arguments against Leopold's imperial venture. And ultimately, they forced Leopold to transfer imperial rights of the Congo to Belgium itself. Another manifestation of the debate over imperialism was concerned with the economics of the practice. Economist J.A. Hobson published a paper arguing that imperialism was ultimately a detrimental economic system in the long run because it depended on markets that were inherently unstable. In other words, imperialism was a drag on capitalism. Over in Russia, Vladimir Lenin, who was certainly no friend of capitalism, found himself at least in partial agreement with Hobson. But while Hobson thought imperialism was an aberration of capitalism, Lenin argued that it was the fulfillment of capitalism, and thus both imperialism and capitalism ought to be thrown out. Now, as non-Europeans who found themselves under imperial rule went to colonial schools and learned Western values, they began challenging European imperialism in various ways. And in order to understand that, let's begin in Africa. 
Africa. In their colonies, Natal and Zululand, the British had forced the native Zulus into working diamond mines, which was hard and dangerous work. Eventually, a nationalist wave took hold among the Zulus as well, and they gathered an army of 40,000. The British attacked them, and for about six months, the Zulus scored many victories. But all it took was time, and eventually the British were successful in crushing that rebellion. But over in Ethiopia, it was a different outcome. When Italy claimed Ethiopia, the Ethiopian king was like, oh, heck no. And remember that one of the main reasons Europeans were so successful in subduing the African continent was because of their superior weaponry. So knowing this, the king of Ethiopia, Menelik II, purchased industrial grade weapons from France and Russia. And so when the Italians came traipsing in to conquer, they were met with stiff resistance and the Ethiopians were successful in throwing them off and remained an independent African state. Okay, now another nationalist rebellion occurred in British India. Now in India, where the British East India Company ruled, a private military was established comprised of both British officers and sepoy, which were Indian soldiers that were either Hindu or Muslim. And because of the rapid westernization occurring in India and the feeling that their native traditions and cultures were being lost or degraded, a surge of nationalism led the sepoy to rebel in an event known as the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857. And once the rebellion began, it spread rapidly across India, which indicated that the Indians were not too happy with British colonial rule. And at first, the British only had a few troops to crush the mutiny, but eventually they did. And the major consequence of this rebellion is that possession of the colony was transferred from the British East India Company and squarely into the hands of the British government. Okay, click here to keep reviewing Unit 7 of AP Euro. And click here to get my AP Euro review pack, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.